Today is Pentecost, one of the major milestones in the Christian story. It doesn't get nearly the attention that Christmas and Easter do, but I would argue that Pentecost is an incredibly important day in the broad sweep of God's story, of God's saving work uh, in the history of the world. It, uh, today is a day that we as Christians need to pay equal attention to. Uh, to Christmas and Easter because Pentecost represents a pivotal moment in the history of the world and in the history of God's people. Christian Pentecost is rooted in the ancient Jewish celebration of Shavuot. Pardon, I knew I was going to mispronounce it. You guys have no idea how much work it was for this good old Southern boy to wrap his brain around some Hebrew. So I'm going to try that word again, Shavuot. Shavuot, that's the word I'm trying to say. So you're probably going to hear it about 30 more times just to make sure that all my homework pays off. Christian Pentecost is rooted in the ancient Jewish celebration of Shavuot. Uh, Shavuot means weeks in Hebrew. So Shavuot is sometimes called the Feast of Weeks. It's celebrated 50 days, seven weeks plus a day after Passover. Shavuot commemorates the day when Moses and the Israelites received the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible on Mount Sinai over 3,000 years ago. That moment is considered the beginning of the Jewish religion, the Jewish faith. It marks the beginning of God's covenant with the Israelites when God said, I will be your God. And the people said, we will be your people. We will be your children. We will live according to your ways. Now, originally, Shavuot was an agricultural festival that occurred at the end of the harvest season when the people would celebrate the grain harvest and the fact that all of their incredibly hard work had finally paid off. It was one of the three pilgrimage festivals where people would travel from all around the Mediterranean region to Jerusalem and bring offerings to the temple. And what kind of offerings would they bring? They would bring first fruits, the first yield of their crops, uh, the best of their crops. They didn't take a cut off the top for themselves first. They took a cut off the top to give to God first, and then they lived off the rest. Uh, on Shavuot, even today, it's customary for Jews to read the book of Ruth. Uh, those who are familiar with the book of Ruth claim it as one of their favorite books of the Bible. It's a book about loyalty, about kindness, and about reverence for God's law. And in fact, some people on Shavuot stay up all night studying Torah. Now, I remember in college staying up all night to study for a chemistry exam, I don't know that I've ever stayed up all night studying the Bible, and yet that is a practice of devotion among some who are Jewish on Shavuot. One of the more delicious parts of the Shavuot uh, celebration is to enjoy foods that are based in dairy and are also sweet, like cheesecakes and blintzes. I'm not much for blintzes, but I love me some cheesecake. So I, I, I can get on board with that part. But the reason that they focus on that is it's not just something to enjoy when you're gathered together with family and friends. It's because the Torah, the Bible, is compared to milk and honey. Just like milk nourishes the body and honey is sweet to the tongue, so God's word nourishes the soul and it leads to joy. Now, Shavuot, this ancient Jewish holiday, it matters to us as Christians because it was during a celebration of Shavuot, which is in Greek, Pentecoste. It was during Shavuot that the events we remember on Pentecost occurred. So let's read about that from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. 
Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Now, let's unpack this for a little bit. That first phrase, even just the first few words, carries a lot. When the day of Pentecost had come. Now, in a sense, it's just locating this event on the calendar for us so that we have some sense of when it happened in time. But on the other hand, it's telling us about God's timing. That's a pattern in Scripture that we see over and over again, that God acts when God knows it's the right time to act. Now, we human beings, we have one sense of time now. We, yes, we have a memory of yesterday. We do have hopes and worries about tomorrow, but we live in the moment. And especially if we're in pain, if we're having a problem, now is what we care about. You want your pain to go away? When do you want it? Now. You want your problem to be solved? Yeah, now. God has a sense of when is the right time to act, when the plans have been laid, when everything is ready to go into motion, when all the prerequisites are in place, when God in the eternal sweep of all that God is out to accomplish knows it's time to act, then God chooses to act. So when the day of Pentecost had come, that was the moment of God's choosing to pour out God's spirit on the fledgling church. And the text goes on, they were all together in one place. Again, a lot of meaning packed into those few words. They were all together in one place. God moved among a gathered community. God poured out the Holy Spirit on a gathered body of people who shared faith together. It was not a random collection of individuals who simply were standing in proximity to one another. It was a gathered body. It was both a personal experience and a shared experience. And the spirit was given to every person in the place. God didn't survey the crowd and said, spirit for you and spirit for you and no spirit for you, but some spirit for you. God didn't make that choice. The spirit poured out on the body of people. The text goes on, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. Now, this was not a storm. Uh, you know, we, we kind of think about storm language when we try to sort of act out Pentecost. You know, we hear thunder and wind and stuff, but that's not what this was. This was God entering into the world, uh, not as the Son, but as the Holy Spirit. Now, the word for wind is a Greek word, noe, which can mean either wind or breath. And that word is used here for the sound of a rush like a violent wind, a violent noe. But there's a different word that's related that is more often used to refer to the Holy Spirit, pneuma. And that can also mean wind and it can mean breath, but it most often in the biblical text means Holy Spirit. Now, I found an interesting note that I find helpful, and I hope you do too. In ancient Stoic thought, pneuma means the vital spirit, the soul, the essence, or the creative force of a person. The vital spirit, the soul, the essence, or the creative force of a person. Now, I personally think that's kind of helpful to think of the Holy Spirit as God's essence, God's creative force. So if you think about it that way, on Pentecost, God's essence, God's creative force was poured out on the church. If that's not helpful, forget I said it. I like it. And it said, the noise of that violent wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, Luke, like all the gospel writers, sometimes has the infuriating habit of not giving us details we'd like to have. In this case, 
We don't know where the events of Acts chapter 2 happened. We know they happened in Jerusalem, but we don't know where in Jerusalem. A lot of Christian readers over the centuries have formed various theories of things, but that's all they are is theories. The text does not tell us exactly where it happens. But from the contents of the story, it seems that they were gathered in a large space probably a space that was suitable for worship, and it might even have been the temple itself or somewhere on the temple grounds. We just don't know for sure, but that seems likely given the holiday, the reason people are in town, and where they would be going to in Jerusalem. Uh, The sound of an intense wind filled the space. I think that is such a fascinatingly curious detail that the sound of the wind filled the space. Luke could have said the wind filled the space, but he doesn't say that. He says the sound of the wind fills the space. Think about that for a bit. We'll come back to that later. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them. Now, this is hardly the first time in the Bible that fire has been a sign and a symbol of the presence of God. God visited Moses in the wilderness through a burning plant, a shrub that appeared to be on fire. And so when Moses uh, saw the burning plant and said, I'm going to go check this out, he drew close and he found himself having a conversation with the divine, having a conversation with God. God led the people through the desert after their escape from Egyptian slavery as a pillar of smoke in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. Uh, Some people have conjectured that it might have been an ancient volcano. Uh, We don't know really for sure what it was in the natural sense, but it was in reality, the spiritual reality, the ultimate reality, God showing up to lead and guide the people from where they were to where they needed to go. One of my favorite stories, I wish somebody would make a movie out of it one of these days, was Elijah confronting having this showdown with the priests and prophets of Baal. When they were each offering their offerings to their gods and, you know, the, the, the prophets and priests of Baal were chanting and singing and dancing and trying to get their God to show up. And then Elijah offers a simple prayer and boom, fire falls from the sky and consumes the offering. You know, and and Elijah was like, drop the mic. I mean, that's the moment that God showed up in fire to prove that God was real and the prophets of Baal were following a myth. When Solomon dedicated the temple, fire came from heaven and the glory of God filled the sanctuary. Fire shows up everywhere as a sign that God is on the scene. Fire gives light and fire gives heat. Light is a way to see. Heat is energy and fire is purification. That's interesting about fire. Fire is an instrument both of creation and destruction. And it's interesting how often those two go together. It says that fire filled the room and a tongue of flame rested on each believer. And again, every person on the place was visited by God's spirit, by God's fire. Not just some, not just a few, but every one of them bore the sign, the symbol of God's spirit taking up habitation within them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the spirit gave them ability. Now look, if this story is not weird enough already, If this is not strange enough already with the sound of a roaring wind filling the room and with every person having a little flame up on their head, they all start speaking in other languages. Now, they were not speaking in gibberish and they were not just speaking languages they already knew that they took a night course and figured out, you know, how to speak something else. They were speaking in the languages of other cultures. And it wasn't a talent they acquired through learning. It was a gift of the Spirit. It was supernatural. It was miraculous. It wasn't something that they had developed. It was something that God brought into being. And the text tells us there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem in normal times was a big population center. It's a big city as far as things go in the Middle East in, those, in that era. And so it's always got a lot of people there. But then you have travelers from all around the Mediterranean basin who have come there from Shavuot. See, I worked hard on learning that word. I'm going to work it in here now and again. Uh, it, it was busy. It was a busy time of year in Jerusalem. And the text says, at the sound, the crowd gathered, at the sound of all these believers talking in these languages that they knew, uh, they were be bewildered because each one of them, each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. It, at the sound of these believers speaking in these different languages, the crowd was bewildered. The, cloud, the crowd was amazed. The crowd was puzzled because they were speaking in their languages. And they didn't look like or seem like the people who should be able to do that. The text tells us why. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now look, it's just a little bit funny. Galileans were generally not known for being multilingual. Galileans were not known to be highly educated. They were not world travelers who picked up culture and languages from all across the world as they knew the world. They were simple folk, fishermen and farmers. I mean, think about the town where you grew up and you know that the town where you grew up was where the good people lived and the town over there, well, that was where the people lived. Well, that was the Galileans. They were the people. They, they weren't the elite. They weren't the cream of the crop. They weren't the intelligentsia. They weren't the academics. They were just plain, simple people. And all of these people who were world travelers looked at these folk and said, are not these Galileans? How can they be talking in my language? That, that, was, that was the implication of the story. It was the kind of thing that defies explanation. How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. Now, there's a beautiful connection between Pentecost and the even more ancient story of the Tower of Babel. You may remember from the book of Genesis how uh, humanity began to come together to share their talents and their strength and their knowledge. And they decided that they were going to build a tower all the way to heaven based on their partnership and their ingenuity. And they were going to be like God and they might even become gods themselves. And God said, well, this is just not going to do. And so God broke humanity up into all these different cultures who spoke all these different languages and were no longer able to understand one another. They were no longer able to work together to accomplish a purpose. Pentecost is a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Babel represented division and the scattering of people. Pentecost is a vision of people coming together under the message of the gospel. See, we get all interested in the speaking aspect that these folks somehow miraculously, even magically, could speak a language they didn't already know. But that's not the important part of the story, as fascinating as that is. The important part of the story, it tells us right here in the text with one simple word. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. Yes, the Spirit of God made it possible for the disciples to speak in another language, but the Spirit of God also gave the gift of hearing to those people from other places, from other cultures. Do you see the beauty of that? That God was making it possible for there to be a bridge between people who knew the gospel and people who had not yet heard it. God was building a bridge and God was working at both ends. That's what the Spirit of God was doing. It was in the power of speaking and in the power of hearing and understanding. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. After the 930 service, I was approached by one of our church members who happens to be an engineer. And in that service, when I talked about the sound of the wind, I made a point of saying, you know, that's weird to me that it didn't say the wind entered the room. It said the sound of the wind. And I thought, why did Luke write it that way? And, and, and I love it. I mean, just to show that the spirit was not given to pastors, the spirit was given to the church. 
This gentleman came to me and he said, you know what wind is, don't you? Wind is, the sound of wind is white noise. Do you know what white noise is? White noise is a combination of every frequency. How beautiful that even in the sound of the Spirit of God showing up, it was a, a demonstration according to the laws of science that God is speaking everybody's language. I think that's amazing. And it took an engineer from Georgia Tech to teach me that. God. See, I, I hope you learn from me, but I learned from you. What a wonderful lesson that was, that, that God even then was saying, I am speaking in a way for everybody to understand. The God Spirit builds bridges so that the message of life, the message of the gospel can connect from person to person and culture to culture. The text goes on, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? You know, people always say that when God shows up. What does this mean? What's going on here? This is, this is strange. This is odd. This is unexpected. This, is, this defies explanation. When God shows up, that's almost always the way that people respond. Puzzled. What's going on? leave us wondering, but others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Eh, they're just drunk. It's a little early in the day to be drinking, but they've gotten at it. You know, those Galileans. That was kind of the tone of it. It was dismissive. You know, some people are puzzled by God's actions. Other people are dismissive of God's actions. They are either unable or unwilling to see what God is revealing. God's work has always had skeptics. That's nothing new. And perhaps there always will be skeptics this side of the new heaven and the new earth. But here's the thing, friends. Some people, some people were captured by what they witnessed that day. Some people found themselves coming to faith. Some people found the tiny shreds and seeds of a newfound faith growing in their hearts and their spirits. And that faith led to a new life and a new purpose. We read about that in the rest of this chapter. When Peter stood up and preached a mighty, fiery sermon and 3,000 people were converted and baptized... When this, this fledgling movement of God that looked like just a few weeks before in the shadow of the cross, when this movement looked like it was going to falter and fail and fade to a whisper, this movement of God is suddenly launched into the world with a bang, with an explosion of power. That's the meaning, friends, of Pentecost for you and for me, and that's why we celebrate this day. Some people read these stories and they view Pentecost, the Christian celebration of Pentecost, as a fulfillment, as a continuation of Shavuot. Now, while Shavuot marks the giving of the law, Pentecost marks the giving of the Spirit. If Shavuot is about God's guardrails, you will live in this space. Pentecost is about God's guidance that I will be your guide. You don't have to live by the guardrails. You follow me in your heart and soul and spirit. Shavuot, if it was about boundaries and Pentecost was about purpose. If Shavuot was about what we don't do, Pentecost was about what we do. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had promised his disciples that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Pentecost fulfilled that promise, Phil Pentecost demonstrated that Jesus' promises were true, that his words were real. And the disciples then and disciples today receive the power of God to serve in God's mission. I want to close with a couple of stories. 
My dad's uncle Martin was known for having the best yard in the neighborhood. Uncle Martin's lawn was the envy of everybody that lived in that subdivision. It was always lush and green and full, no bare spots, no outcro- no outbursts of weeds and everything. It was just perfectly green, perfectly full, and perfectly manicured. It was amazing. His secret was that every winter, he would burn it. He would just throw a match, burn it edge to edge, and it would lay there ugly and dead and messy for weeks. Aunt Florence had to hate it when Uncle Martin tracked ash into the house. But that fire that got rid of the old, that got rid of the dead, that got rid of what used to be but no longer had life in it, made way for new life, new growth to come. That's what the fire of God's purifying, empowering presence does, is it helps us to embrace a new way of life and leave behind the old. The scriptures tell us that God's mercies are new every morning. The scriptures also tell us that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Present tense, is a new creation. Not once was a new creation, but now you've gotten old again. Is a new creation, meaning that God is continually recreating in our souls and our spirits. Fire is the symbol of that being God's work. Second story. Years ago, I had uh, the opportunity to go sailing with some friends on Biscayne Bay. It was a perfect day for sailing. Clear blue skies with just the occasional cloud to make it pretty. Temperature was perfect. Just a light breeze that's good for sailing so you can move along, but it doesn't scare you to death. It was just a perfect day for sailing. So we board the boat, gorgeous boat. I mean, just, you know, one of those boats that make you go, wow, Lord, I wish I had a little bit more money. (laughs) Just a beautiful boat. We climbed aboard, you know, uh, you can't sail right off the the dock there. So we unmoored the boat and we hooked up the little engine that goes, you know, to, to try to get out from the dock and go sailing. We get out to where we can begin. We unfurl the sails and the breeze just kind of fades away. And where it had been a gentle breeze with gentle waves lapping on the side of the boat, everything just went still. And so we sat there and we waited, but the wind did not return. It takes wind to create motion. It takes energy. It takes power to move in a direction. God's spirit was given to the church so that the church can move so that the church can act, so that the church can have the impact on the world the church is meant to have. See, Shavuot was about carving out a people. If you're my people, you're going to live within these boundaries, these guidelines, and that will be the marker. That will be your message to the world that we are different because of the God we worship and love and serve. And because we worship and love and serve this God, we will stay within these guidelines, these guardrails, the law. But Pentecost was about creating focus and movement and impact. It was about mission, not just identity, not just living within the boundaries, but about fulfilling God's purpose. That's Pentecost, friends. And I don't know if it's entirely appropriate for me to wish you a happy Pentecost. But I do wish you a blessed one. And I pray that the Spirit of God may show up in surprising ways for you and through you in this day and always. 